Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our event on Britain 2021, the year ahead in politics. Um, thank you, everyone, indeed, for joining this morning. We've had a great sign up over 270 people. So um, it's obviously a popular um, event and lots of people wanted to find out what the year ahead in politics is going to look like. My name is Alice Waitman. I'm the founder and CEO of Hanson Search. Hanson Search is an international headhunting business specializing in communications and public affairs recruitment. I'm gonna quickly hand you over to Janie, my colleague who is hosting the event today. Um, and we'll introduce the panel. Um, we're gonna let the panel talk for the first of 30 minutes around the topic and then really open up to Q&A. So please do use the functionality at the bottom of the screen um, for the Q&A and, um, and chat function so that I can then feed the questions into the panel. So thank you very much indeed. I'm now gonna pass over to Janie. Brilliant. Thank you, Alice. Um, as Alice said, I'm Janie Emerson and I'm the Managing Director for Hanson Search in the UK and Europe. Thank you everybody for, for joining us today. As we all know, 2020 was a challenging year with an ongoing global pandemic, turbulent Brexit negotiations and splintering across political parties. So as we enter 2021, we wanted to gather together a panel of experts to talk about how the political landscape might shape up over the course of the next 12 months. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our panel today and thank you all very much for joining us. We're joined by Dr. Hannah White, Deputy Director at the Institute of Government. Hannah oversees the Institute's programme of work on government, parliament and the civil service and has extensive knowledge of Westminster and Whitehall based on over a decade of experience in government. We're also joined by Steve Hawkes, Head of Strategic Media at BCW. Steve had a career in journalism spanning 25 years, working in Westminster for a wide range of newspapers, including The Sun, The Times and The Evening Standard. We have Anita Boateng, Senior Director at FTI Consulting. Anita previously worked at the highest levels of government as a special advisor in the Cabinet Office, Ministry of Justice and DWP. And Jim Blythe, Corporate Affairs Director for the UK and Ireland at Tartar Consulting Services. Jim is a specialist in tech policy, immigration, Brexit and trade, and is the chair of the Confederation of Indian Industry in the UK. So to start us off, I'd really like to ask our panelists to give us their thoughts on how they believe the government will navigate the year ahead. With COVID-19 still dominating the agenda, how do they or indeed can they get back on track with their manifesto promises? And what do you think their key priorities will be? Hannah, I'll come to you first on that one, please. Thanks, Janie. And it's great to be here today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I feel a heavy sense of responsibility to be trying to tell everyone what's going to happen this year. but. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, in short, I'd say my sort of somewhat depressing summary of the situation is that this is going to be a very unpredictable year. Um, and I think government bandwidth is going to continue to be restricted, uh, both by uh, the aftermath of Brexit and by COVID. Uh, it's going to be hard to get visibility of other issues. Um, at the Institute for Government, we focus very much on the sort of uh, the processes of government, nuts and bolts, and how government gets done. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the restrictions on bandwidth, which we've seen in the civil service over the past few years, um, are, are going to continue. Um, it's, you know, even though Brexit is now is now done and we've left the EU, there's going to be continue to be lots to be done in the aftermath. Predictable and unpredictable consequences of Brexit will continue to take up government time, there'll be policy to make, there'll be legislation to pass. And as we're already seeing, you know, sort of there's the unpredictable um, or perhaps predictable, depending on who you are, issues that have arisen in Northern Ireland um, in terms of um, the impact of the, the deal on uh, food um, exports there and so on. So that is going to continue to take up lots of time in government. There's also, I think, signif significantly going to be constraints on parliamentary capacity. Um, it's not clear what um, other legislation the government has ready to go in terms of implementing manifesto promises. And they're still having to do a lot in terms of soaking up parliamentary time uh, in terms of uh, passing uh, post-Brexit legislation, but also lots of COVID stuff, which they hadn't factored in, obviously, when they came into government. Um, in terms of manifesto priorities, I think we need to think about, you know, what they want to now get onto, but also how those manifesto priorities will have changed. Um, and I think, you know, obviously the obvious things there to think about are the radical change in the economic situation. <laughs> We've already seen a manifesto commitment in the form of the 0.7% aid target ditched, 
as a result of, of the change in economics. Um, also, government will be conscious of the way the public priorities have changed as a result of COVID, you know, dramatic effects on the health services, on education and so on. And, and you know, they won't necessarily get able to just pursue the things they were thinking of doing anyway there. And there's also, I think, um, and other people may be better placed to talk about this, there have been changes of personnel uh, within government and that will change uh, the sort of different priorities that, that, are, that the government gives. Um, mostly, I think, the next step for government in lots of areas is, is one of definition. Um, so I think, for example, levelling up um, is, you know, something that's talked about a lot, but it's not really clear what it means. Um, you know, is it about infrastructure, is it about local infrastructure, big infrastructure, or is it really about building human capital? Um, so I think that's something the government's going to have to define similarly around Global Britain. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to be unavoidable that government's going to need to pick up its uh, commitments around climate change with the uh, chair of the, the COP26 conference coming up. Um, in the background, some things have been trundling on, some things they said they'd do in their manifesto. So for example, civil service reform. Um, but really, I think, you know, it's going to be a question for government of what they can progress around the edges of the other things they're going to have to do and what they can do without looking like they're not still giving their all to tackling the pandemic um, and the consequences of the, of the pandemic for the economy. And I think that's going to be a really tricky balancing act for them. Thank you, Hannah. Steve, can I come to you to get your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think building on what Hannah said, and, and, and thanks for inviting me on, it's a great excuse to put a tie on for the first time. It's <laughs> eight months. Um, I think um, I try and look at it about two halves, because I mean, COVID is obviously going to still dominate. And I mean, it could be dominating, it will linger for a long time, but I think it will dominate until uh, probably about late June time, in, in which after that, the government then quite quickly has to pivot onto a whole host of other priorities that is very conscious. You speak to cabinet ministers now, they're very conscious that dread the thought there's another election, um, you know, 36 months away. And um, they know that in year two of this parliament, they have to then plan and put measures in place now that they can look back on in 36 months and say, this is where in this government, in this parliament, we put our measures in place that we can go back to and say, this is what we did. This is what we promised. This is what we're doing. And so I think a lot of it will be about trust. They now, they've had a bit of a kick in, understandably, in some points over COVID. And now can they be trusted to get this right now on the vaccine, the vaccine rollout on, on taming this virus and then be trusted to win the peace? You know, can they be trusted now to rebuild, all this build back better? Can they be trusted to do that? And I think if you look at a number of set piece events, the budget is going to be huge. Um, it's currently slated, I think, for March the 3rd. I wouldn't be surprised to see it delayed, especially if the mayoral elections are going to be delayed. They'll want that closer to the mayoral elections. And someone said to me this week, you know, if this was Nigel Lawson doing this budget post-Brexit, think about what he would have done with the freedoms he has, so the freedoms the Chancellor has now. And so I think number 10 would quite like Rishi to, to really go for it with a budget because of all the tax freedoms, all the things he could possibly do. But then you've got the problem of this massive £400 billion budget deficit. So I think that's what we're going to see in short is, is a COVID dominating the start of it and then government quickly trying to pivot onto its domestic agenda and fulfilling some of these manifesto promises they, they pledged to do. Fantastic. Thank you. Anita, can I come to you for your thoughts? Um, thanks very much, Janie, and thanks for having me on the panel. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I think I agree with a lot of what Hannah and Steve have said, but I just want to pick up um, a few sort of small points from that. First of all, on this point around spending, I think the key thing, if the government really does want to get back on track in regards to its manifesto promise, it's worth reflecting on what that manifesto promise really was. Like, what were the public voting for? What were the Red Wall voters voting for when they punted for the Tories for the first time for some in, in generations? And I think that was really a vote for change. Yes, it was a vote that was about frustration with regards to the Brexit stasis, but it was saying, you know, we want to try something different. And so so the government, I think this point that Hannah made about how do we, how does a government articulate and define and build a levelling up agenda um, that isn't going to take decades and years to come into fruition is a massive challenge for this year. And, and my view of how the government gets on track and, and makes that feel real is that actually the much mocked um, 4 billion fund for levelling up that was announced in November of last year might actually be quite key. Because I think if we do see this small scale investment in high streets and um, small things to improve the look of high streets and improve facades to have, um, you know, low level um, 
projects that happen in your local town and in your local city. I think that kind of thing will make the public feel certainly that the Conservative government is investing in those things. And I think in the run up to um, the, the elections um, this year, which may be delayed for, from May until September, um, I think those kinds of incremental processes and small scale projects that can be implemented um, very quickly could be one way to help the government to kind of articulate and show what a levelling up agenda might look like very quickly. And then, of course, there is the kind of big infrastructure projects that are uh, ongoing and that need to kind of be kicked up a gear. Um, the second point I'd make is around spending. I certainly think that there is the, the key for government success in a way is for Boris Johnson to 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 win over um, Rishi Sunak in, in the big battle that's happening in government right now, which is Rishi Sunak is a classic Treasury man is saying over the books, over the books. And Boris Johnson, whose instincts are slightly more let's spend now and, and fix the problem later. And, and Rishi seeing this as like we have to, you know, heave to fiscal rectitude in order to make sure that there is a clear dividing line between us and Labour in the next election. I kind of think that might be a problem for a few years. And actually, if Boris Johnson wins the argument and is able to ensure that this budget is not the, this is the budget that allows us to balance books, but is the budget that allows us to continue and accelerate some of the investment in public services that the public, I think, now wants to see. And that's another way of, of getting things back on track. The final point, very quickly, is personnel. I think both in respect of a reshuffle, which I think is essential because the cabinet that was built in 2019 was built for a very different world to COVID-19, um, which brings in, I think, a few more experienced heads and, and the changes behind the scenes, which I think will see the government pick fewer fights and be slightly less bullish in terms of its messaging. Um, and in terms of how it's sort of, you know, the sort of we'll defend, 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 and then you turn if we have to. I hope that that changes and that we see slightly more um, emollient communication through this year. Fantastic. Thank you, Anita. Jim, can I come to you? Thanks very much, Janie, and thanks very much for, for having me. And I think the others have covered this really well. You know, in the short term, the obvious challenges are COVID and getting the vaccine programme really underway and demonstrating that government is capable of delivering. And I think, you know, winning back trust that, that you know, they're capable of actually doing what they say they do and so on on the basics will be really important to this. And, you know, starting with the vaccine programme uh, will be the first priority. And secondly, of course, then it's economic recovery. I, th I think there will come a really difficult period in the next couple of months where companies that have been propped up for the last 12 months or so may not survive. Zombie companies and so on may well become the story of the day. And unemployment clearly is going to rise further from where we're at. You know, the challenge for government there is, is economic recovery, are the policies of recovery enough? Or are we actually looking at a period of economic regeneration? What does that look like in practice? Does that mean that we have to focus in a more interventionist way on particular industries or particular parts of the country, certain places that may have higher unemployment, fewer, you know, fewer industries than previously? How do we make sure that in term, the international investment is brought into the right places? You know, these are gonna be real challenges for the next few months. And to make sure that the government is actually listening to these problems, I think they'll have to demonstrate a different set of economic policies than they've demonstrated for the last 10 years or so. Fantastic, thank you all. So a few of you mentioned this um, in your initial responses, but thinking about the sort of local and, and mayor elections that may happen this year in, in May or, or September, how might um, these influence the agenda as we move towards them? And also what's the government's relationship with the media might do in terms of sort of influencing on these? And we've had a question from the the audience as well around the elections in Cardiff and Edinburgh and how they'll impact on Westminster. So if I could come to you first on that one, Steve. Small one there. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll try and talk <laughs> up as well. Sorry, I've been told off a mumbling. I um, I think if I take them one by one, the local elections, I think, you know, it's a very political, you know, politico obsessive sort of subject, but I think they will be really key. I mean, last year's ones were postponed or, you know, they were cancelled basically. And um, these are going to be the first real test of what the public think about the Boris Johnson government. Do they really, are, are, is the Tory government actually, which is still somehow ahead in the polls, is that real or is it not? You know, I mean, are Labour making inroads and where are they making inroads? This is going to be, it's going to be a fascinating, basically a verdict on the Boris Johnson administration because you, you keep hearing how people are fed up. You know, they're fed up with the sort of, you know, the non-secretive Dominic Cummings, the incredible goings on at Department for Education. 
you know, is there going to be a verdict? Is there going to be um, a punishment as such at the polls for this? Can Labour make inroads? I mean, Labour, for them to have a good year, they have to take the West Midlands. They have to get Liam Byrne taking the West Midlands position over Andy Street. And I think you can see some of the Tory fears by the fact that there's talk of a delay. You know, and OK, in tier five, in tier four, you can't really do the leafleting and the canvassing that you'd want to do. But I mean, it's quite suitable, I think, for the Tory government at the moment to push this back until more of the country is vaccinated, until we're let loose again to go out and perhaps visit our grandparents. You know, I think that's when they would like to go to the polls rather than May. And so Labour obviously are quite keen for these polls to be on May the 6th because they want it to happen then. And it also plays, as I mentioned earlier, into the budget. You know, do you do you put the budget closer to the mayoral election so they can put all this money into the West Midlands, for example, or this pork belly politics? So it's going to be a key test. And I think we're already beginning to see a couple of stories this week that you may not have seen. Guido Fawkes had a story about um, some sort of Labour internal uh, press release fiasco, which is exactly the sort of thing you'd see in an election campaign. You know, I mean, Anita can tell us more about that sort of thing, but but that that's the sort that those sort of stories are beginning to seep out now. So people are beginning to put their minds towards this, and you'll obviously get a lot more in domestic policy as we get nearer to that. On the union, I mean, look, I mean, I think because of COVID, it's it's overshadowed all of this. You know, there was a story on BBC today this morning about the fact that supermarkets are having major problems in Northern Ireland. You know, there, there was always predicted Sainsbury's, all these supermarkets can't get their goods into Northern Ireland, which would be a huge issue if it wasn't for the the a devastating pandemic and they, this will become more to, to light now and I think this will be another huge issue going forward not just Scotland's independence but what we're seeing in Ireland you know with the government has to deliver for Northern Ireland now um, otherwise there's gonna be a massive pressure now for reunification there I'll, I'll let some other people talk about this but yeah I think this is again to my point in the earlier question once we get onto the second half of this post-COVID we're going to quickly pivot onto very very strong arguments on domestic policies and who can win the peace and these elections will be a key test of that key barometer of that Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Jim, could I get your thoughts on this one? I mean, the really interesting uh, feature in the next few months will be Scotland. And of course, the SNP are, are soaring in the polls and the challenge from the Tories and from Labour um, is, is quite different from where it was before. I mean, I'm not convinced I could name the Labour leader in Scotland, and I suspect there are quite a lot of Scottish voters in that position as well. I mean, that will clearly have a big, a big impact on where we go. You know, say the SNP do win a majority in the Scottish Parliament, as you'd expect, and then they say, all right, well, we want a referendum, uh, as we had a few years ago, and then the UK government rejects it, and that ends up in the Supreme Court, that's not a great look and it's probably not a, a great way to start the Scottish Parliament term and to begin the discussions about the Constitution that will inevitably have to have in the next few years anyway. Those tensions, I think, from Scotland will also be tensions from Wales and from Northern Ireland, probably to different degrees in the next few years. And the government's going to handle that really carefully. Can it say, no, you can't have a say on this, you know, you've already had your say and this devolution settlement is relatively young, or can it say, actually, we, need, we can make some changes, you know, here are some more powers you can have or some you know different functions that you can you can exercise i'm not sure the government's done the thinking on that yet and i think this this will become a big political issue for them further down the line this year great thank you jim hannah could we get your thoughts yeah i very much agree with that last point you made jim um that i don't think the government it has a clear strategy i think you know michael gabe in particular is very interested in the sort of future of the union questions um, but it's not, they've not been able to devote the time to it and they haven't devoted the time to it to what extent that's a, a choice versus a, a, um, a compulsion in the current circumstances. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. One is I think it, this is actually a really interesting time because I think COVID has made devolution real to people in the UK in a way that it just hasn't been um, in the past. People have, have finally had brought, had brought home to them what different people have responsibility for in their different parts of the country. And I think, you know, Nicola Sturgeon in particular has been very alive to that um, in, you know, wanting to get out and make her announcements first, um, wanting to differentiate herself. Um, and, you know, that's all part of the, the SNP's, you know, normal agenda. But I think that it's also been the case with, you know, the city regions and the mayors have had the prominence for people um, in, you know, in exercising their responsibilities, which which hasn't hasn't been the case in the past. So I think that you know the the thinking and understanding in the country when they go to the polls about you know what devolution means um, will have evolved uh, over previous um, uh, situations, um, previous elections. Um, and then I think I was just going to say on the sort of the union um, question. I think what will be really key is, is the position that Labour takes. Um, it's really tricky. 
um, situ situation for Labour to know quite how to jump on this. But you know, if Labour come up with a with some kind of Devo Max option uh, versus saying, you know, actually, you know, we will allow uh, 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 another referendum versus sitting on the fence, that is going to have a big impact on, on how the government has to to take this forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Anita. Any thoughts from you? Um, thank you, Janie. And, and just to develop um, Hannah's point specifically about what we've learned through COVID, I agree. I mean, I had so many conversations with um, SPADs and uh, um, uh, ministers last year who were saying, "I, you know, we basically didn't know that the, 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 some, of the, some of the powers that we had given away and the extent to which we couldn't dictate what UK-wide policy was going to be with regard to handling the pandemic. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a local councillor um, in London, and it it's really apparent to me that the the kind of in, in normal times, and I've you know run local elections from CCHQ um, as a special advisor, it does tend to be the case, as Steve has said, that it's a referendum on how the country basically thinks the government is doing and how the parties are doing. I think in this year, it might be very interesting because we may see um, much more of a kind of a, a referendum on how an individual council or a mayoralty or you know Wales and Scotland, uh, Scotland are felt to have handled the pandemic in particular because I think that um, there's been so much more prominence to what's happening in terms of local policy or what's happening with regard to um um, you know the difference between Wales and Scotland and, and England with, when it comes to handling the pandemic and I think it could be a really interesting sign of what's to come and, and with that further definition there is much greater accountability and there's much greater maybe some 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 bias in favour of incumbents who have perceived the pandemic well I and mean, I think that this might be a year where it's less about how big, you know, big C Conservative and big L Labour are doing and much more about how you think your local politicians um, have performed. Um, on the question about uh, Scotland and, and Senate elections, I think that the, the one issue in my mind that I can see Boris Johnson having to resign over is the loss of the union. I, I think for all the talk, I mean, beyond, you know, incredible, inconceivable scandal, the only scenario in which I can see the Prime Minister not being the Prime Minister until 2024 is Scotland. And, and, and I cannot stress enough how much politically this will be a defining issue for this government. And I agree that actually the Conservative position is easier in some ways because they basically just decided we are going to be the people that say no um, but that doesn't do all the work that needs to be done in order to preserve the union and so I think that as much as um, you know Michael Gove might change his um, zoom name to reference the union all of that's all very well and good I think ultimately there are more people clamoring for a strategy than knowing what that strategy might actually entail with respect to building a real connection um, for the union across the entire United Kingdom. And I don't think that problem is going away. And I think in this elections this year, we will see just how starkly it's clear that, that the, the current status quo is not generating as much popular support as, as the Conservatives would like. Really interesting. Thank you, Anita. Um, I know a lot of our audience are you know, public affairs professionals and, and people who engage with government on a regular basis. And I guess to come back to you, Anita, with the, the next question, you know, in sort of the turbulent times and with the constraints on bandwidth that, that Hannah mentioned as well, you know, how can people engage with government on issues that maybe aren't, you know, COVID related or Brexit related, but are still very important to themselves or their clients? Thanks, thanks, Janie. Um, and yeah, so I would, I, I slightly disagree with Hannah on the bandwidth point. I, I agree that actually, when it comes to the big ticket items, like when it comes to, for instance, things like the big planning reforms that are planned, like those things will be hugely contentious and the government will need to devote a lot of political time to making that kind of thing work. And I think handling of that kind of issue, I mean, the government will be more reluctant to A, get that process going um, and will have less time to give it the kind of rally that it might be given if it's it was the first order problem and not the, the third order problem so I think when it comes to big issues I think it makes a massive difference um, but my experience of working in departments um, you mentioned a couple there MOJ DWP um, cabinet office um, Wales office CCHQ is that fundamentally a lot of the time it is a policy constraint 
that, <laughs> that encourages a department to go, oh no, there's a big bandwidth reason why we can't tackle this particular problem. And so what I want to sound is first of all, a note of encouragement that if, you're, if you can make this issue, the issue, whatever it is that concerns you, relevant to the department and make the case for why it will help them then i think there's still a good opportunity for you to get your case made and, and i should say hannah i mean i think i'm agreeing with you but i'm just saying there's different kinds of, of bandwidth in government i think the point about legislation absolutely stands there are so many things that smaller departments want to do um, that will help in general in terms of connectivity all sorts of things that are going to get pushed into 2022 it's just a fact but in terms of winning those political arguments and getting um, you know, regulations looked at and getting government to make concessions, that work should absolutely still continue. And that's what I'm advising my clients um, when it comes to, to public affairs. Um, the second trick I think we sometimes miss is um, we kind of think about issues and kind of go, say, take connectivity again. Oh, it, it would be great for the government if connectivity was better. That's not how you sell it to government. You kind of have to think about it as why would that individual minister or why would that individual department actually benefit? What will, what will be the crystallized thing they can do? What can they announce? What can they say? How can they visit? Like, how can we make our request feel tangible in terms of this will deliver a real benefit to you? Um, and the third thing I'd always say is pick your battle. Like, if, if it's your thing that's nice to have but not essential, then, then maybe that's not the, the hook on which to hang all of your lobbying or your engagement pick the thing that you know really matters and pick the minister or the or the civil servant that you know could actually has power to act or influence or whatever and and be really targeted in your approach because I, I sometimes think there's a tendency to go if we can just have a five minute chat with a minister i'm sure this will be resolved and not to do the bit of that legwork that involves understanding who actually has the levers of power where they can be you know where they can be helpful and making sure the ask is as specific and as beneficial to that minister or civil servant as possible or as bad as possible brilliant thank you anita some great advice there hannah i don't know if you'd like to respond on any of those points yeah i mean i think actually um we're in violent agreement um anita um I mean, I, my my thought on this was really just to say you know find the bits of the system that aren't overwhelmed focus on your highest priorities and link them to government priorities because I mean, if you, if I think about you know the sort of government uh, department submissions on the spending review, this you know which turned out to be a, you know a brief spending review, everything was badged as levelling up, you know, and you know it's very easy to sort of to make a a, a sort of general argument, oh this will help with levelling up, but the thing that you actually need to do, and this is where I totally agree with you, Anita, is to show you know what how will this help the government, and what will the government have to show for it? Because I think the thing is particularly on levelling up, you know, a lot of the things which you might, you know, the, the measures that you might have put in place to, to understand where the country was at, at the point that the election happened, lots of those measures have probably gone backwards in the course of, of COVID. And actually, you know, you want to think about what will be measurable, what will, what will government be able to show has changed, which will be a real benefit if they do the thing that you're asking them to do. So you know, basically just echoing what you were saying, Anita. Great, thank you. Jim, would you like to add any comments? I agree with everything that Hannah and Anita have, have both said. I think, you know, make sure that you, as always, bring something to the table that meets their needs and agenda. Um, and I think also in general, you know, we, we're in a time of uh, really big regulatory change, uh, big change on the trading front as well. This should be boom time for public affairs professionals. This should be the time when we kind of demonstrate that we really understand the needs of businesses or the needs of the organisations that we're working with, the needs of citizens and so on. And that there are things that you can do to make time tiny tweaks that will really improve people's lives and improve the competitiveness in the economy. And that, that really is what we should all be about, I think, in the next couple of years. Big opportunities for us all, I think, in this virtual room uh, to make an impact and make a difference and get some rules changed where it affects us. Fantastic. Steve, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, look, I mean, if you're struggling to get through to government, um, do give us a call at BCW, we'll help you, you know. Um, <laughs> no, no, I think, um, I think to, yeah, to everyone's point, I think um, I'll give out virtual cards. No, I think to everyone's point, it's the, it's the transactional thing. I think what's, you know, I've been in this, in this sort of, P, in the PR side of the public affairs side of 14 months now. I think it's, it's very similar to say, when you're pitching a story, you know, you're, you're speaking to government who are, 
that we all talk about bandwidth, they don't want to hear 20 pages of uh, moaning about what's not working. They want to hear a solution. And ideally, they want to hear how it ties in with their agenda. So if you think of a Venn diagram, if you're thinking about you know, investment in skills, the government's going to say, great, can you do it in Stoke? Or can you do it in red car? They, you know, they're less interested even about the South thing. They won't be the North thing. And so I think, you know, when you're discussing stuff with government, go in with a solution as well and go and be aware of what each department and each minister's um, priorities and, and ask are. And I think the government deserves some credit. Department for Business in particular has run a number of um, phone calls with um, consultants throughout COVID, um, you know, almost on a weekly basis at one point to talk about what the government was doing and what the department was doing and to allow us to air... Um, clients' concerns and to feed those back, which was really, really good, and um, and that that's to be you know appreciated, and, really, and it would be good if they continue that. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I can see lots and lots of questions coming in on the Q and A. So one more from me, and then we'll, we'll move to sort of questions from our audience. Um, and this one, I'll start with you, Jim, if that's okay. With the approval of the new Brexit deal, how do you think our trade negotiations will influence things? Because obviously, it's a, it's a huge change for the UK, and and how do you think that will um, influence the political agenda? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it's been a long time since the UK made its trade policy on its own and thought really seriously and strategically about what its strengths and weaknesses are, where it kind of lies on the international stage compared with other countries and kind of where where the future of the of different sectors are and what, you know, which trade agreements, which countries can uh, maximise those benefits. I think there will be some, some changes for industries. You know, we saw in the debate about chlorinated chicken and some of the uh, agri-food standards with the US and the potential US trade deal, the, the political debate, and dare I say it, sorry, Steve, but maybe the media debate as well, isn't quite mature enough, actually, for, for some of the implications that are coming. We know with, with trade deals that government will you know, go off behind the scenes, negotiate these deals, and then bring them to parliament and say this is a place to come clear. And I think in some cases, parliament will approve, and in, in other cases, parliament won't need to approve uh, some trade deals and some elements of it. What does that mean for the political debate? You know, I'm not sure we've thought about some of the trade-offs that we're prepared to make. Um, there are some issues with the EU that need to be resolved in the next year. You know, there are issues around financial services and data adequacy, which will have an impact on, uh, on a huge impact on competitiveness in different sectors. Now, what's next? Next after that, and what do we what are we prepared to prioritize and to sacrifice in trade deals with say India or with the United States or with other countries outside of that? Um, so I think there's I think there's a job of work for government to do there. I think there's also a job of work for them to do at the kind of international level at saying, look, we lead on free trade and we lead on uh, on you know, tariff free trade around the world. There are opportunities with the uh, the G, I forget which number we're on now, but G7, I think later in the year, and the D10 that the government would like to set up with other democratic countries, opportunities for the UK to show real leadership on trade this time um, and I, I think you know the the next six months will be a kind of a foundational moment for them on setting this the terms of this debate for the next 10 years but quite a long way for us to go I think before the uh, the kind of public debate is up at the level that it could be so we really understand the trade-offs involved. Absolutely thank you um, Anita have you got any thoughts you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd add just two things. First, I think that um, yeah, the political debate, I, I kind of have sympathy with what, what Jim was saying, um, in that I don't think that we've quite accepted that the EU issue is not over. Um, and I think there's a little bit of a lot of the public voted to kind of not talk about Brexit again. Um, and a lot of the political debate feels a little stale and trapped in a bit of a circle. And I actually think that Labour Party is particularly naive about this in thinking that it can just sort of vaguely stay away from the whole thing and never have to talk about it again. But I think there are still defining questions that will, will continue to be um, continue to come up over the next three and four years, where it will need to have a view. And actually, in actual fact, just the, the sheer fact of the fact that a lot of um, you know, powers essentially are coming back to the UK means that you do need to make more policy choices. Um, and, and I think that there's not quite been that conversation um, within well, both political parties, but I think it's um it's going to come to a head earlier within the conservative party but will continue to be a problem um for labor um the second point i'd mention is that i don't think anyone beyond your odd right wing intellectual voted for um brexit for trade deals um but nevertheless i think it's it is striking that that liz Truss, both through continuity deals and, and new ones has been going gangbusters on that i don't think there'll be defining issues but i i do think for instance india um is a great example of a country that has placed immigration quite central to a lot of its um, you know, trade discussions and I think that will be something that comes up 
um, whether it's this year or next year, um, if there is to be a trade deal signed. And likewise with the US, I think that actually it will be less toxic to sell to the public um, if it's a Joe Biden trade deal as opposed to a Trump trade deal. So the politics looks slightly better, but the fundamentals of what those challenges and trade-offs are, I think we've never really had a conversation about it. I'm not sure the public is really ready for that conversation. And so I don't see that moving particularly quickly um, this year. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, anything you'd like to add? I think, I think to what people have said, I mean, Brexit's almost, I know Boris didn't want to talk about Brexit ever again and all that sort of thing, but I think the, as a nation, we're so over Brexit that we've sort of forgotten to talk about it. But as Anita says, there's so much that's going to come out in the wash almost um, down the line about, you know, we've seen that with stock shortages, people having ham sandwiches confiscated in Holland and all that sort of thing. And I think on trade negotiations, as, as Anita says, Liz Trust deserves, you know, a big pat on the back. I mean, in 58 trade deals, you know, that was, we were told that would never happen, you know, and it has happened. And, and OK, it might be a rollover, but it's something. But I think to Anita's point, the big thing for me is then, is, is the government ready to, to take responsibility and be bold? You know, this whole thing about being taken back control, what are you going to do with it? You know, it was, already, it was all good to, to blame um, Brussels before for mistakes and things we couldn't do. Well, now we're in charge. It's like, what are we going to do with it? And I think secondly, on I think we'll see a big lurch towards Asia and, you know, and, and wooing the CPTPT, the Asia Pacific sort of block. And I think uh, Boris Johnson is going to India at the end of this month. And then that's the big trade off. You know, I think he desperately wants a trade deal with India. Um, but is the public ready to accept, you know, special fast track visas for a lot of Indians uh, as, a, as a consequence of that. And I, you know, perhaps they will be because it's our decision, but it's going to be a big test going forward because trade deals are going to mean you know, greater immigration in a sense. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, we've had so many questions that have been coming through. Um, so I'm going to try and condense a few of them um, just so we can get through them. But the top two um, areas have been around uh, manifesto and climate change. So we'll tackle those first. Um, and Anita, perhaps you can um, uh, discuss the sort of manifesto question because you mentioned that earlier. Um, but one um, of the audience has asked, isn't COVID an opportunity for the government to abandon the manifesto? Anyway, a manifesto is normally just a glossy brochure and really will they move to implementing their views on tax and regulation? Um Okay, well, I don't agree that a manifesto is a glossy brochure. Maybe that's because I'm biased because I've been part of those conversations and I see how agonizing they are. And they are both defining for how the civil servants kind of um, work out your priorities. And also I think that they are a, an exercise in, as we've been talking about, political choices. Um, I think the government has been in its manifesto and, and almost the flavor of its manifesto has been about investment, it's been about public services, it's been about looking into nationally and it's been about leveling up um, so in a way like yes maybe the letter of every single line of a manifesto is not going to win you an election you cannot simply go in 2024 and say look we can tick all these boxes vote for us again it's about how you make an emotional argument and how you you make those commitments feel tangible to people on the ground um, but I, I I mean I I, I think manifestos mean something and I, and I think the question really is um, this is a Prime Minister who likes to have his cake and eat it. I think it's actually one of the defining um, characteristics of, of Prime Ministers that some people find hard to define. And, and therefore, I guess my argument is to deliver a manifesto or to deliver really anything, you have to make choices. You have to accept that there are trade-offs. And I think one of the big trade-offs this year is going to be around how much do you seek to balance the books versus how much do you turn the, the spending tax on? Um, because I think that, that this year, the country, I, I think we've seen that some of the political debates around spending move. Um, and so really to, to achieve anything, I think it does require some form of a trade-off. And I think if the government makes that decision and, and sticks to it, I think it will do very well to deliver its commitment, um, a manifesto commitment. If it refuses to make a choice and it might be decided for it. Great, right, thank you. I'm um, looking at the uh, climate change questions, we've had quite a few on that. So looking at the year ahead, what priority will be given to the climate change agenda and COP 26 November and the need for government policy announcements and action prior to COP? Will this be more of a focus in the second half of the year? Um, Jim, maybe you could uh, answer that one. 
It's not an easy one. I think COP26 will be a huge issue for the second half of the year, and it absolutely has to be. Uh, the Biden administration will want to get onto these issues really early on. It'll come up in all of the bilateral discussions that Boris Johnson has with other world leaders uh, as the year goes on, and it will become the, the central issue. Um, you'd expect America, with John Kerry as the chief negotiator for them, would want to um, really set out a progressive agenda here as well to get the US back onto uh, the, the, the agenda it was on under President Obama before the current president. Um, I think for the uh, for the UK, I think some of the challenges are, you know, we haven't talked about adaptation and what adaptation looks like for businesses and for individuals. What does it mean for cars? What does it mean for your boiler in your house? What does it mean for, for costs for businesses? How are we going to uh, tax and price uh, carbon and energy use and all of its different forms? I think, again, that debate really needs to accelerate and really needs to accelerate quite quickly. And there'll probably be some uncomfortable choices that the government will have to make, which will cost people and businesses money. Uh, in the next year or so but in order to demonstrate global leadership that's where the uk government i think has to be in the next few months so i think expect a lot more of this coming up in the next year can i just come in there quickly i think i think that, I, I think then if you look at the spending review it gives you a clue to what actually might happen you know throughout this year and, and, and there was that green industrial revolution i think which slightly overcooked it a bit you know this 10 point plan that uh, where the chances did put some money aside for like wind um, wind power, hydrogen, you know, zero emission, green ships, all that sort of stuff. So there's money allotted there that will be spent. But the COP26, gives, there's no excuse now. The government has to act on this. And I think the key question, again, comes back to the budget. You'd expect to see, I think, to Jim's point, a lot of green taxes to sort of pave the way for this, this revolution that is needed now. If we're going to ban you know, the sale of cars and diesels by 2035 or whatever date grants come up with last week, you know, we're going to have to pay for it. So we need taxes for it. But will the chance to be daring enough to raise taxes, which was a manifesto commitment that he wouldn't do, to pay for this. That's going to be a key thing, I think. Great, thank you. Um, the next question was very much about um, the government and how to reunite um, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Um, perhaps, Hannah, you could uh, tackle that question. <clears throat> yeah, just an easy one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think, um, you know, there's there's different narratives coming out of the government, which is probably quite problematic at the moment. I mean, I think there's a strong sense, um, you know, from some within number 10 that that actually what the, the, the Prime Minister sort of seemed to say off the cuff about, you know, devolution has actually been a disaster, you know, is actually the thinking of, 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 of some people who are there. Um, and, and others who are, you know, who are, who, who are, who are thinking, well, actually, you know, that's not going to be a sustainable argument, and we needed we need a different answer. Um, and I think you know the the short answer is that you know a lot of of, of thinking needs to go into this. I'm a bit skeptical of, about the the line that goes, well, you know, we just need to badge everything as as UK government spending in in Scotland. Um, I mean, the same potentially applies to sort of levelling up spending. But I think the evidence of the EU teaches us that actually, e however much you badge things as you know, so and so funded this thing for your local area, people don't necessarily. Um, you know, give you credit for that when it comes to the next election or the next referendum. Um, so actually, you know, just a strategy that says, well, if we tell everyone in Scotland that actually quite a lot of the things that go on in Scotland are funded directly by the UK government, that will make them, you know, think twice about, about independence. I'm not sure that is going to be enough of an answer. So I think there needs to be more sophisticated thinking about it. Anyone else like to add anything to that? Yeah, I need some. Can I one thing? I, mean, I completely agree with you that it's fairly cynical. Let's put a flag on it and, and hope for the best. It is not going to get us where we need to go. I also slightly caution against um, the alternative view, which is like we just need to make an emotional case, um, which I think is a very sort of glib and does feel quite English centric as someone who's been quite a number of years in Scotland uh, during the referendum and, and covering political programs and political debate um, up there. And, and I guess my feeling is that it is sort of it's sort of a bit in between those two things it's how do we it's not simply let me just tell you how much money we've given to scotland uh, but but it is kind of saying well look at let, let's let's make real some of the benefits that you've actually provided um and I, I think it does require i mean ultimately let's look at the difference between um how nicola sturgeon's um is perceived to have handled the pandemic and boris johnson and it mostly comes down to communication i i, I actually don't think it becomes down to material policy decisions and and so it is it, and i think 
think part of that has got to be having more cabinet ministers speak in Scotland and, and, and in Wales and in Northern Ireland and more of them try to bring um, the political debate and political attention to those um, issues. And I know that the Northern Ireland Secretary, I mean, I did used to work with him, I think he's great, but I think he really understands this. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's got to be, it, it's, it is, as Hannah says, it has to be a sophisticated programme. It has to encompass um, making the argument for what, what benefits, you know, Britain um, being part of um, a United Kingdom provides. It's got to be about communication and it's got to be a lot less than just saying let's get some English celebrities to say how much they love Scotland type stuff. I think just quickly if I can come in just really quickly I mean we've had a, we had a major referendum just a few years ago where there's a lot of people talking about what went right and what went wrong you know like with the with the, the Remain campaign got it wildly wrong in 2016 and then and then what the commission didn't do in terms of appealing to emotion or whatever and the project here backfiring so we can learn from all that. Um, and I think, as Anita says, there, there needs to be a sort of emotional case for Scotland. I, I just find it, I find the whole thing interesting. The SNP has spent four years saying to Westminster, saying to the Tory government how crazy they are to leave their, their biggest union. And then, um, you know, the Scots are now going to argue for that. And then, you know, we've spent all this time saying we want to leave the EU and now we're going to tell Scotland they have to stay. I just find the whole thing would be fascinating to see how they, they flip those arguments around, really. Yeah, and just to add, to add one final thing before we move on, I think that the the fact that the UK has left the U European Union, I think, does two things. It strengthens an emotional case for Scottish independence and this feeling that we, you know, we're moving in a direction that we, you know, the country's moving in a direction that we don't recognise and we want to, you know, seek our own fortune. But it does make the practical case for independence a lot trickier around borders and tariffs and what it means for a UK internal market. I think the real challenge is that that how you have that conversation without it seeming like oh no 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 you're not going to have the pound type stuff and i think that i think the lesson that i learned from, from 2016 is that the seeds of an of, of that that ref brexit vote were, were not sown in, in the in the david cameron campaign is where i slightly disagree with you steve i think it was less about that campaign and more about not recognizing where people's positions actually were and i think the shocking thing that um, a lot of Conservatives learned in 2013 before the Scottish referendum was, oh, even though the polls say everyone wants to stay in the union, the numbers are incredibly soft. And I just think that I worry that the same situation is here now where ultimately like we can, a campaign can be a good or bad campaign, but some of the seeds of this have been sown, for instance, in last year's handling of 2020's pandemic mm -hmm. and not in what we promise now or what, yeah. we, what we can say that the um, United Kingdom has delivered for Scotland. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so we've looked sort of, um, uh, nationally. Um, we've had a question about more this sort of global um, policy. So what are the panel's expectations of the government developing and delivering on global Britain strategy? Who would like to take this one? Well, it hasn't started well by cutting overseas aid, but I mean, I, I'll let other people speak. I just think it's interesting what position Britain adopts. You know, there, there is a position, I think, to be a bridge between East and West um you know with the new biden administration and then uh, having more influence in, in asia pacific but i think it's also an internal one about what is britain now you know are, do we still do we admit that we're not the global heavyweight that we think we are or that we always used to be or what is our position now and i think there's it'll be really interesting to see some think tank thinking around that about how we where we position ourselves and what we as i said before you know now we're in control of our destiny or you know, we probably were before but now we're saying we're in control of our destiny so what are we going to use it for and what are we going to be I think, you know, we, we still have a huge soft power around the world and it's about using that. And I think it's, it's, an, it's an interesting discussion to come, I think, where we position ourselves. Absolutely. And then there's another question on the G7 pres presidency. What do you think their priorities should be? And what do you think they actually will be? Um, Hannah, do you want to tackle both those questions because they sort of go together? Yeah, I mean, just building on what Steve was saying, I think um, the, the government really has to has to prioritise in terms of, of building a, a sort of global Britain strategy, it won't be able to do everything and it's got to think about the opportunities coming up, which include the G7 and if there's a G20 before that, include COP26, but also include the pandemic in the sense that, you know, British science, British, um, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, the Oxford vaccine and so on, provide an opportunity um, and we have, you know, we have strong institutions here. Um, people like, you know, the Wellcome Trust and others who, you know, are, are really good um, spokespeople for, for, for science internationally. 
And I think the government needs to give really careful thought to where our competitive advantage is, where our USP is, and build on that, and build on it in relation to the, the issues that the, the world is, is worried about right now. And I think both COVID and COP26, where we know we've got that built in you know, opportunity to show leadership are things that they, you know, they, they really need to focus on. Another question again on sort of international is, um, what do the panelists think will impact the UK of events unfolding the US at the moment? Um, who would like to tackle that one? Jim, would you like to? Sorry, repeat the question again. Jim, it was just building on the on the uh, global side. So, what do the panelists think um, will be the impact on the UK of the events that have unfolded in the US at the moment? Well, I guess this is one of those kind of global leadership questions. Where does the UK see itself as a mature, established liberal democracy, and where does it see itself as a member of the Security Council and as a member of the of the G7, as a founding member of this D10 group that Boris Johnson's talked about? You know, actually, there there is a, a role for the UK, I suspect, in in espousing that kind of liberal democracy and spreading its values around the world. And you know, that that I think is part of where the UK's foreign policy has been for the last twenty years, and will clearly have to kind of step up again now. I mean, I think there's an opportunity for the UK to to um, I'm not sure reset its relationship with the US is the right expression, but certainly to, to recalibrate its relationship with the US, to think about what, what the trade partnership will look like in the next few years, and to think actually, if our big challenges are the technology revolution and all of its implications, the climate change uh, issues and adaptation and innovation, all the implications there, inequalities, identity, global migration, if these are our big challenges, then how do we as the UK work with our biggest partners, Europe, the US and India, to make sure that we actually make some difference there. And I think that's part of the assessment Britain has to do. Steve said that we have great so soft power and cultural power. We absolutely do. We're also the fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world. We've got huge economic power here. Um, and I think using that and deploying that is really important uh, in the years ahead. The first meeting between Boris and Joe Biden is going to be really, really interesting because yeah. Boris has got to do a lot of making up, right? I mean, he's got a lot, to, a lot of making up to do with that administration. I think that's, they're going to be going and reversing that car, him and Rob and all those people pretty quickly away from Trump. And I mean, that's what's interesting. I think that what Joe Biden sort of insists on, I mean, hopefully he'll be magnanimous and there is still that special relationship. Um, but the way Boris sort of eats humble pie on that one is going to be interesting. Can, can I answer the question in a, in a slightly different way? Um, so you've talked about UK-US relations. I think the other thing that's really striking is that, you know, some people say that we live, we all live in America's culture wars. And I think that there is an increasing tension um, within um, the political discourse in the UK, and certainly the right-wing discourse in the UK, about whether there is benefit from having these culture wars. And I actually think there's a lot more consensus in the UK, and I don't think that's the right way to, to move forward. But I think there is going to be an increasing um, tension around those who want to, you know, bash the BBC. And we can see this with Nigel Farage's new party. You know, this idea that we need to kind of have more of a, you know, distinct um, anti-establishment force um, within our politics, which I don't think would be particularly help, um, healthy, but I certainly think it's going to be an interesting theme. Um, the second thing that I just wanted to quickly mention is disinformation. I think one of the things that we've learned from what happened in the US is simply that, you know, when you a country has no agreed shared facts, has no agreed account of what its country is and its story, then we see in increasingly escalating tensions and you know in some instances extreme amounts of violence and um, and I'm not concerned that that's where the UK is heading but I just think that this point around information and I think we've seen more I see more conspiracy theories now than I certainly saw a few years ago that will continue to be a problem and um, I don't think that's necessarily going to lead to the demise of our nation or anything I, I just mean that um, there is an increasing challenge for politicians for media for all people who have a stake in and ensuring that we have a shared agreed, you know, level st status of facts to ensure that we're not propagating on Twitter or all those other sources um, things that are conspiratorial or not found in fact. And, I, and I'm a bit concerned that we've seen a lot more of that than we than, than I certainly have seen in, in recent times. And I'll give one example, just one, um, uh, Rosanna Allen Khan, who 
you know, it was a senior figure in the Labour Party um, who basically tweeted that, that Nadim Zahawi, who's the vaccines minister, had gone and gotten vaccines for him and his family. And it just wasn't true. And I, and I kind of think, you know, check it and then say it. And I'm sure I could think of a Tory example, too. This is not me attempting to sort of bash Labour alone. But I just think we've all got a massive responsibility to make sure that we're double and triple checking information before we share it and before we tweet it. I think that's that there's going to be I think this next decade is going to be about social media and politics and how how politicians and how governments, you know, what they do with social media. Is, is it too late to regulate social media now? Is social media its own force and what that means over the next 10 years? I mean, the, the whole Trump and Twitter thing, you know, I mean, Trump revolutionized the use of Twitter for politicians. And then, you know, how he was going to regulate recently but how politicians how do they how do they control social media or is that too late now because this is going to be where the voters of the future get all their news now you know we've seen this with anti-vaccination stuff in france this is going to be where the you know i, I hate it i pay, it pains me to say it but newspapers as such will do, you know go down in influence and social media is going to be huge and it's just how politicians get their heads around that and whether they regulate them if they can Great, thank you for that. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming in on um, spending, so I'd like to sort of focus a bit of time on that and opinion on um, non-COVID health spending and also social programmes. So um, one of the audience has asked, almost two thirds of people who have died because of COVID were disabled and disabled people and their families have disproportionately felt loneliness and worsening mental health. Publication of the National Disability Strategy is planned for spring, but what hopes the panelists think there is for investment in social programs and wider support for disabled people and other disadvantaged groups, given the priorities and economic pressures that have been discussed? Who would like to sort of tackle this initially? Sorry, I'm happy to, to do a, a first bit um, with my former DWP special advisor hat on. Um, I, I think maybe I'm going to sound a bit pessimistic um, in, in two respects. The first is that um, I think that the conservative ethos and approach to this issue is very much founded in how do we get as many disabled people into work? And, um, a lot of it is focused around that. And, and I think that's a, a noble enterprise. But I think what you're talking about is really how do we get social programs off the ground on this so so on that specific point i think that local authority funding is really key to this um and i i don't see much beyond sadiq khan's proposal of a 10 percent increase in um, council tax uh, much increased funding going to local authorities that means that we're going to see a significant step change there however i think that the public attachment to the nhs the, the way in which it's stepped up to what has been an incredibly challenging year and the reality of the fact that the government knows following the Brexit referendum, et cetera, that the NHS needs to continue to be a priority, means there is some potential for some, some kind of national programs um, that you know, are using some of the national funding um, specifically towards disabled people and, and mental health. And I think those are two themes that I'm hoping disabilities, um, mental health and social care are kind of three things that, that do get significant resources and attention um, this year. Schools is going to be another one. I think schools, we've seen that with the whole homeschooling thing, the deficiencies there and how this government, one of the manifesto commitments was putting more money into the school science and infrastructure. There's a hundred billion pound infrastructure fund, but yeah, how, what are they going to do about schools and education? Because I think most, most parents will feel that there's not enough money in schools at the moment, nowhere near enough for what we want to achieve as a nation. And I think, um, I mean, on NHS, NHS, you can't touch the NHS now, arguably, because it has been so pivotal to what we've lived through. But I think there's still an argument in there, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but, you know, about gross inefficiency in some parts of the NHS, you know, and, and will the government dare to confront that as it tries to pay for social care, which is going to be a huge bill. They need to sort social care. And how do they how do they dare confront inefficiencies in the NHS while lauding the heroic work of frontline workers there? You know, this is something that's going to have to be done. I mean, the NHS was what they constructed in 1940s. And I think they're going to have to tackle this at the same time, which could be a political minefield, given what Labour will say. But you know, there, there's not this magic money tree, although it feels like it at the moment. And so some, this money is going to have to come from somewhere, either by higher taxes, you know, because they're going to have to pay for more frontline things. But where do they get it from and how do they reorganise and, and make things more efficient? Jim, do you want to add anything on the spending side? 
I think it's probably time to grasp that social care nettle that, that various people have tried to grasp in the, in the past and haven't really had a huge amount of success. You know, with the majority of 80 and with several years left in this parliament, I think those who are, who are looking for a form of social care would expect there to be some action in the next couple of years. And that does obviously involve more spending. It also involves really, really tough choices about, about who gets less and who gets less of the government's, government's uh, money. Um, you know, that, that kind of debate, I think, needs to really pick up and really start now. I think on the national disability strategy point and the point on um, inclusion more generally one of the one of the things I noticed in 2020 was quite a lot more focus from employers and from big employers um, about inclusion about diversity about making sure that the, the people that they're hiring where they are hiring at scale um, are genuinely um, you know, genuinely a diverse pool of candidates they're looking at that's been a big focus of business in the last year and I think we will see uh, dividends actually from that in the next couple of years as more and more companies really focus on that and the other focus is of course on well-being I mean my employer is hugely focused on that mental health and so on and I think that's really really important for the next few years I know the CBI and others are doing big work on that and it's important that when we see businesses doing a good job that we shout about it and say this is actually great and employers are following the right lines here and when we see those who aren't doing a good job that we shout about that as well and Hannah finally I'll, I'll come to you before um Jenny's going to close up um, any thoughts on on uh, the spending side uh Really, it's a more general point, um, which I've been wanting to make, which is a, really a short term one, I guess. But um, I think in terms of raising uh, some of these issues which have been coming through, one of the things which we, we all need to pay attention to is, is the situation that Parliament is in at the moment uh, with COVID and with the, um, with the restrictions. There are, you know, there are ongoing limitations on the ability of MPs to participate in proceedings and to raise issues and some of the normal uh, ways in which they'd be able to do that they can't participate in unless they come to Westminster and so on and I think that you know over the next year it's going to be really relevant to, th to be thinking about what opportunities there are actually to, to raise some of these issues and to get them on the agenda of the government because otherwise the government is going to be sort of hell for leather dealing with dealing with Covid and it's going to be much harder to get some of these things onto their agenda so I think um, just being conscious of that is really important. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you to all of our panellists for, for joining us this morning. Sadly, we are out of time, but I know there's lots of questions that have come through and I, I hope we've managed to get through the majority of those. Um, there will be a recording of the webinar that will be sent to all of you in a couple of days time. It will also be on our website and um, all of the details of all of our um, events are on the website. So do sign up for alerts if you'd <clears throat> like to join us at a future event. But again, if I can just say thank you to all of our panellists for joining us and, and all of our audience too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.